Excellent. Good morning, everyone. My name, my name is Ruben Moda. I'm one of the assistant directors at the McBurney Disability Resource Center. Here on campus, I oversee accommodation services. I'm Mike Moore. I'm an accommodation specialist with the McBurney Center. I work with students with disabilities and help them make sure they have the appropriate accommodations they need for equal access to their classes. I wanted to give an uh, introduction to Mai Magla. She is our uh, new director of the McBurney Disability Research Center. And Mai started two, three, three, about a month ago. This is week three. End of week three. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike and I, we're just going to dive right into our presentation. We're running a little bit behind, and we're very committed to um, trying to wrap up at 9.30, because you will be tired of us by about 9.20. So uh, <laughs> before we get started, we have some pre-presentation activities or logistics to work out with you. Uh, we'd like to know, would anybody be willing to serve as a note taker for today? If you would be willing to serve, um, you could just go to the uh, to the website and click on this link and it will load up a, uh, I believe, a Google Doc on which uh, you can take notes. Any volunteers? Great, thank you. pay attention, so I'll do it. No problem, thank you very much. I want to give you a brief, direct outline overview of our presentation today. We're going to spend the first roughly 15 minutes doing our presentation today. We have 20 minutes reserved for an activity, and then we're going to wrap up in the final uh, 20 minutes. We're going to be using direct instruction. Uh, we have an embedded video for today's presentation. We have group work, and then if you decide to work individually, you may do so as well. Uh, normally, um, we would typically ask or have invited a sign language interpreter to ensure that we have equal access as part of our universal design platform. Um, and so we also would ask that this lecture uh, be recorded. And lucky enough for us, Karen is doing the recording. So let's move right on into it. Very good. So. Uh uh, as Ruben indicated, we're from the McBurney Center, and we're here to present on uh, universal design for learning in online spaces. Uh, our main goals for today are to talk a little bit about the McBurney Center and who we are and what we do, so you can understand a little bit about the students we serve, why this is going to be important on campus, and what you guys do. We're going to talk about what universal design is, what universal design for learning is, and then see how we can talk about how to implement that in electronic or online spaces. So in addition to Mike and I just basically sitting around all day drinking coffee, uh, watching YouTube videos, we actually work with students with disabilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act in Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. So basically those are our two federal guidelines that help guide our work. And what we do is we try to ensure that the university is not discriminating against a student with a disability. We, because these laws stipulate that no one with a disability can be excluded from a federally funded program. So our work is to, along with Mari, is to meet with students and determine if the condition that they have rises to the level of a disabling one under the American with Disabilities Act. So a condition can be considered a disability if it uh, significantly or severely impacts a major life activity. Our role is to work with faculty, students, and programs to kind of iron out what are the accommodations that students are eligible for that would give them equal access and that are reasonable and can be readily implemented by the university. I just want to point out that our accommodations are designed to ensure equal access, really want to stress that, and not to guarantee success. Why do we exist and why are we presenting about universal design today? Well, recent surveys reveal to us that on our campus alone, we have many students, faculty, and staff and administrators who identify as being a person with a disability. Roughly 7% of students on campus identify as having a disability. This does not mean that 7% of the students on campus are all registered with the McBurney Center. In fact, uh, disability resource centers on uh, college campuses across the country usually have a smaller percentage of students who actually uh, register with the office than actually identify on a campus as having a disability. We see roughly about 6% of faculty and at a higher percentage, 7% of staff administrators identify as having a disability. Just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to flip over, uh, skip over this slide and go to this uh, statistical slide here 
that gives you a breakdown by our 11 disability category, how do students identify? And this is a really powerful slide because our concept of disability in the past has been that if somebody who has a mobility impairment is in a wheelchair, you see them, it's very readily apparent in your face they have a disability. The landscape of disability is changing to where 92% of our students have an invisible disability. Our largest population is students with psychological disabilities, followed by students who have ADD or ADHD, followed by students with uh, chronic health conditions. We're really seeing um, learning disabilities take a little bit of a dip in numbers, and that's really because of how the K-12 uh, schooling system has responded to learning disabilities both in diagnosis and both in intervention models. So what is universal design? Universal design is a method which originated in um, architecture back during the World War II era as a way to offer an opportunity to design structures that would provide greater access to individuals within a community, within a city or um, an area. And this architectural design has slowly morphed to product design and what we are seeing today is universal design for learning in which there are opportunities for all individuals to be able to engage with an ar architectural structure, a product, or learning that is a little bit more accessible for them. So really, universal design is designed to ensure that everyone, because of physical, sensory, and other needs, can uh, take into account access and opportunities to give input into designing. This graphic really gives us a lot of information about why is it important that we pursue universal design? Why, do, why should we as instructors, professors uh, here at UW-Madison and across the country engage in universal design? Because clearing a path for people with, with disability clears a path for everyone. So there are three principles of universal design for learning. Principle for one focuses on multiple means of representation. So how are we organizing our course content and knowledge so that it's accessible to a wide range of users? The second principle of universal design to learning is how are we ensuring that students are engaged? We know highly motivated students, and we know students that are really connected with the content and uh, who make it personally meaningful for them are more likely to be successful learners. And then concept number three, multiple means of expression, is how are we gauging students' learning through assessment? And how are we ensuring that they have an opportunity to express their mastery of the content that's been taught to them? I'm going to flip over this slide uh, quickly. And as we continue on in discussing the three principles, universal design for learning helps ensure that we're meeting 100% of students' needs. It's a little bit unrealistic to expect that we will always hit this 100% benchmark. However, if we keep these three concepts in the back of our mind as we design courses and as we engage in instruction, we'll be more likely to recognize that there's no one optimal, optimal way of representing or presenting information and that just being conscious will help us to connect and provide access to individuals, which is extremely powerful. So we have a video that will talk a little bit about, uh, give some examples of universal design and learning. Uh, when we talk about some of these principles, it's one thing to hear them, but to see them in action is, is pretty helpful. So uh, Ruben's gonna pull this up and uh, uh, we'll look at that, and then we'll talk about how we can up with some tips for applying this stuff in online space. Universal design principles are essentially a set of guidelines that help developers create accessibility features in the design of their products. Examples of this can be as simple as the inclusion of closed captions on videos, or as complex as the recent changes in HTML5 that are designed around allowing websites to be navigated in multiple ways using assistive technology. One aspect of the second principle of universal design is that information be presented. Let's try that again. 
and in multiple and often simultaneous ways. This is referred to as multimodal learning. In a nutshell, multimodal learning is the belief that when multiple learning modes are effectively used together, the learner will gain a better understanding of the concept. <coughs> so, what is a mode? Anything that communicates meaning. Take the word stop, for example. The word itself represents a concept, but not really the context. Add color, and the meaning suddenly becomes deeper. But add shape, and now we have a stop sign. But what if you're colorblind? What if you don't know the language or the visibility is low? Even when one of these modes are missing or inaccessible, the meaning of the stop sign can still be communicated. This is the nature of multimodal learning. Different modes work together to create meaning, with each mode contributing to that meaning in a unique way. But is this an effective way to communicate? <laughs> Probably not. Effective multimodal communication works best when words and pictures are presented simultaneously and in close proximity, but also when extraneous words and images are removed. Animation and narration work better than animation and text, and well-designed layouts are shown extra effective when working with learners with low knowledge or with high spatial learning abilities. Research shows that multimodal videos are effective at improving student performance for both basic and advanced skills, as well as in interactive and non-interactive environments, but they are most effective when used to present complex material in an interactive environment. So, how does multimodal learning work with the principles of universal design? Let's say you have a concept you'd like to teach. You know the disabilities of some of your learners, but it's a pretty safe assumption that you don't know all of their disabilities. So you start by explaining the concept in multiple ways. You use text and images together. This can really help students who may not be able to hear you or understand what you're saying to still make sense of the meaning. You add audio for those who aren't best through listening or may not be able to see well. You add animation to that audio to focus attention. And by animation, I mean anything that moves on screen. And you add closed captions to all the audio. YouTube offers an easy way to do this. Once you are finished, test your video. Turn off the sound and see if it makes sense. Listen to the audio without any images. Does it still make sense? Show it to someone unfamiliar with the concepts. Does it make sense to them? <coughs> Remember, the core of multimodal learning is communicating your concept in the most effective way possible. And the core of universal design is that everyone, regardless of limitation, will be able to access that communication. Learning to communicate in this way will require practice, and it will involve a lot of trial and error. But the better you get at it, the easier it will become. And once you start to see the benefits of these strategies, it will all become worth it. I really like the stop sign. Less than you don't think of it because we're so used to seeing the stop sign. But you just see stop. It's very different with the additional context there. It's, it's a little more meaningful. So. Uh, we talked about the three principles generally, and we're going to talk now a little bit about um, what those might look like in an online space, and just some basic tips and tricks you might want to implement as you uh, design your classes. Um, you know, universal design uh, in online spaces can take place in a variety of settings. We're going to talk mostly about uh, some ideas for how you might use it in a learning management system like yeah. Canvas. Uh, but keep in mind that if you're ever designing an online class, using social media or applications for your teaching, a lot of these principles will still apply. Um, so why don't we move on to uh, our first slide about multiple means of representation. So again, uh, this, this principle is the idea that you want to make your content available in multiple formats to your students. Traditionally, it's a textbook and lecture. Right? That's kind of the standard uh, uh, way classes are presented in a brick and mortar school, but uh, when, when you start designing things uh, for universal design and, and you use your uh, online spaces, there are some options to really broaden those, uh, to, to broaden that to be, to be more universal. So some ideas are create a universally designed syllabus online. Have a photo of the instructor and maybe even a, a video introduction of the instructor. You might also give a video tour of, uh, of the class and what's expected. Um, make sure your syllabus has very clear instructions about your learning management system and how to use it, and also how to 
how all the different modules are going to connect to those learning objectives. Uh, again, the idea is that you have multiple pathways for mastering the material, and if you can kind of create a, a couple of different roadmaps for how you get to those, uh, those, those specific learning objectives, that can be extremely helpful. So that's a good tip there. When you do use your different forms of content, like video, audio, and images in your online spaces, try to make them as accessible as possible. Uh, the best way to do that with video is to ensure there's captioning and or a transcript available. And if you're going to use video, or if you're going to use images, have you know, alt text or uh, embedded descriptions in your photos. Um, if we're going to use PowerPoint slides uh, or other uh, documents that you're creating, kind of have sufficient size in your fonts. Good contrast is important. You don't want to overly complicate your, your outlines or your slides. Or if you want to have really complicated outlines or slides, have an alternative outline that's going to be a little bit simpler. Those are going to be easier for people who have difficulty reading, you know, dense text, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, if you're going to use documents or PDFs, try to make sure that the text is, a, is accessible. What that means is you need to be able to be able to highlight it, and that will allow someone who's using a screen reader or other types of accessible uh, software or adaptive technology to manipulate the text so that they can access it, best it as, uh, access it in the way that's best for them. If you simply scan an image of an old article, that's not going to be accessible unless you use some of those uh, character recognition software programs. So as far as representation goes, a lot of options uh, in the online world. When we come to multiple means of expression, now we're talking about how do you assess, does your student understand the material? We've got, we've applied multiple uh, methods of, of accessing the material and, and presenting what we want you to learn. Now, how do we know if the students understand it? Well, traditionally, it's written exams, written papers. Well, you've got a few different options in the online setting. You can do certainly the written papers as we've done before, but you can do work, uh, virtual group projects with students, have online tests and online quizzes, have students uh, write blog entries. Uh, create online portfolios. There are a lot of different options here. Discussion forum participation can be a great way of assessing whether your students are understanding what they're learning and uh, a great way to break them. Have students present uh, videos of uh, uh, how they demonstrate that they understand the material. Or even have them create a little website or multi other multimedia presentation. A lot of different options here. And uh, you know, some students are going to be better with taking tests than others. Some students will be better with written papers. And if you really vary up that, um, uh, the options here to give different, uh, different ways in which students can demonstrate they understand their knowledge. Uh, again, you're giving, uh, it's more universally designed class. So number three is going to be our multiple means of engagement. And this is sort of how do you get students to, to really take ownership and really engage in the material. And, there are a couple of different <coughs> principles that you really want to keep in mind. One is that having choices for how you're going to learn that material, we talked a little bit about that, is, is going to allow students to really invest themselves into the, and take ownership of the material. And it'll allow them to understand the material the way that works best for them. Hopefully they'll know what works well for them. Options are a huge deal. Uh, and student choices will allow them to, to kind of figure out, you know, how do they make this class uh, personally relevant to themselves. Um, you have a few different ways you can get students to interact with each other or with faculty in, in an online setting. You can use an online discussion forum um, or you could use real-time chat or email. You can use real-time chat for those sorts of interactions with each other. I caution you about real-time chat and other real-time communications um, as a mandatory project. Some students aren't going to do well with writing things um, that they'll be concerned about. Spelling, if, if some students have issues with spelling or anxiety, that sort of thing, forcing them to operate in a real-time setting can be really stressful and create barriers. But situations where they can uh, write emails or participate in an online discussion forum where they can craft their message, review it, use uh, spell check and grammar check, that <coughs> be a little bit more accessible for some of those students. However, a real-time chat uh, instead of office hours could be a great way 
to be more inclusive for students who maybe have uh, mobility disabilities and getting to campus is a challenge, or if there are anxiety issues and they you know, are having a difficult time leaving the house, but they still want to interact with their professor, that's another way you can uh, interact with, with your students and, and kind of create a more universal option. So lots of different ways you can uh, get involved with your students. These are some tips. Um, this is certainly just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other ways you can implement this stuff, um, but these are some ideas that we brought forward for you. Um, Ruben. So I just want to share a little bit with you about um, how I've set up my online class, um, classroom. I'm an adjunct instructor, not for this university, but another university. Um, and I teach in their master's in international education program a course called Theories and Curriculum um, Design. And uh, it's targeted towards students who are working overseas who are already certificated teachers from their home country who wish to kind of um, develop their instructional toolbox, if you will, and also earn a, a master's degree. So I, for my course, I use Canvas. I've been using Canvas for the past three years. Before that, we used a different learning management system. The course is um, 15 weeks long, and these are some of the things that I do in the course. Some of it is a programmatic requirement. For example, I'm required to have the syllabus available by June 1st, and the course does not start until almost the end of September. And we have that such a huge um, time there because students need to order books, and if they're living in Chad or Liberia, it, it will take them a <coughs> to, to get the, the course text. So I ensure that I have a paper text, and then there's also an online text. So there are two different text resources that I use, and I intentionally chose an online text. It's not the greatest uh, textbook that I want to use, but I want to ensure that students had it in two different formats. Um, on the syllabus, I put all of the discussion questions, so everything that would be required in Canvas that they would actually be doing is also on the printed syllabus, so they, can, they know exactly what's expected of them, along with the rubric for every assignment. The students self-select what they want their assignment topics to be, but they don't get to determine the weighting or, or the grading or the rubric or anything like that. So I determine that, but they are within free reign to choose. I want this topic, and what we do is they email me offline and we figure it out what their topic is, and I, of course, have to link it back to the learning objectives for the course. So that way it's relevant, it's meaningful, and it keeps them engaged. Um, the final product, project, uh, it can be in any format the student wishes. If they want to do a video, a term paper, a blog, whatever it is they wish to do, they just have to have to work it out with me ahead of time. Um, and then, in addition to using textbooks, we use blogs, we do a uh, website, and we also uh, review podcasts um, as part of the instructional design of the class. All right, so that was a very quick run through on universal design and learning in online spaces. So our project for today is to take a World War II history syllabus. This is actually from the UW, 1991. The history department has a lot of their syllabi available here. It's kind of fun to look through them. Uh, but this is all they had for the 91 uh, spring semester World War II class. And it's, if you look at the last paragraph, it has three learning objectives. Um, understand the roots and causes of World War II. Learn how the experience of war affected the daily life of ordinary people. And examine the impact of war in 20th century, 20th century history. So our project today is everyone kind of a, has a feel for World War II and history a little bit. So. Uh, how could you come up with um, some ways to expand this class and, uh, that, that would make it more universally designed? And John has uh, a Canvas class shell that's available that you can log in and create some modules and come up with some good ideas. And we'll get back together and talk about it in about 10, 15 minutes. Feel free to work in groups or on your own if you prefer that. 